coming back for our session two of identifying your Catholic ancestors genealogy workshop series. This one is going to be about requesting genealogy records. I'm excited to have Katie Vest and Heather Veneziano with me today to be speaking. And Kimberly Johnson has also returned to watch. So again, um, this is a collaboration of a six week Zoom webinar between us, the City Archives and Special Collections at New Orleans Public Library, the Office of Archives and Records at the Archdiocese of New Orleans, and New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. Today we will cover how to order records from the Archdiocese of New Orleans, New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries, and we will also list city archive records that may help. It will be a quick sort of go over of some of our records and our guide to genealogical materials, which is going to be your best friend online. Let's do some housekeeping real fast. Please make a note of any questions you have during the presentation and reserve them until the end when we open the chat function to ask them. If you could, please avoid crosstalk at that time. Just enter your question and enter it once. We will get to as many as we can by 1215. Today, we will be addressing the content of this presentation only. If your question pertains to a future presentation, please save it or we will be posting all our contact information at the end. It is also going to be, of course, available on the program website. You can email it to us or call us during business hours. Recordings of each of these sessions will become available on the Tuesday after it airs. So our last session, which was held last Saturday the 12th, we posted the YouTube video recording of that session on this past Tuesday, even though there was maybe sort of a hurricane going by. <laughs> but it is up there now. Um, you can access the links to all of these things as they become available through the website at archives.nolalibrary.org. I will show you in the next slide exactly where to click on our website to find that. So again, don't worry if you can't write as fast as we talk or you can't write everything on the screen. On Tuesday, we'll be posting a recording that you can go back through and view and pause as needed. And we will also be posting the slides of the presentation. Let's talk about where to go for those session materials and recordings. You wanna to go to our website, which is archives.nolalibrary.org. And once you're there, you wanna click on this link up at the top in the new at the archives section that says identifying your Catholic ancestors fall 2020 genealogy series. We wanted to make sure that it was very clear. And even though this little square to the side is probably a little small on your screen, that is a picture of the program page. That's where all the links will be. There will be a full series description PDF. There's going to be a link to register via Zoom if you wanna share it with even more of your friends and family. We appreciate that. We love having you all here. I'm so glad that you guys have been able to join us in this virtual mode, given the present times and how things have changed. Um, of course, we'll have links to the Office of Archives and Records at the Archdiocese website and the New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries website. And then on a session by session basis, we'll have supplemental materials, supplemental links that we will generally try to get up the supplemental materials before the session airs. And then of course, the slides and the recordings afterwards. Now let's meet our presenters. Uh, last, if you came to our last weekend session, you met Kimberly Johnson, who is a senior processing archivist, records analyst for the Office of Archives and Records at the Archdiocese. And she helps there manage conservation and preservation of historic and current records. She holds a Master's of Arts in History and is a certified archivist. She's joining us to watch today. Our two main speakers today will be Katie Vest and Heather Veneziano. Heather Veneziano is the Director of Public Engagement and Development for New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries, as well as an architectural historian and cultural heritage advisor with the preservation firm of Gambrel and Peak. She holds a Master's of Fine Art and a Master's of Preservation Studies. Next, of course, our first speaker today will be Katie Vest. She is a research archivist for the Office of Archives and Records at the Archdiocese. And in addition, she researches and translates genealogy requests in French, Spanish, Italian, and German. She holds a Master's of Arts in History with an emphasis in public history, and she is a newly certified archivist. Um, hi, Heather and Katie, if y'all wanna say hi real quick. I skipped right over. 
Hi, everyone. Hi. And then, of course, I'm Amanda Fallis. Uh, I am a librarian and archivist at the New Orleans City Archives and Special Collections at New Orleans Public Library. And I work there with genealogical and municipal government records. I hold a Master's of Library and Information Science, and I am a certified archivist. We're sorry. Your conference is ending now. Please hang up. I don't know if that, I think that was, I don't know who that was, but we should still all be live, I hope. Heather, Katie, are you guys still live? Yes, I think that was someone on the phone. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> Continue. Okay, with all that said and all those introductions done, I would like to pass on to uh, Katie Vest to begin the first part of our presentation today. Katie? <laughs> Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. As Amanda mentioned, my name is Katie Vest. I am the research archivist at the Archdiocese of New Orleans. Today, I will be helping you through the process of requesting your genealogical records from the Office of Archives and Records at the Archdiocese. When requesting genealogy with us, one of the most important steps is the process of requesting the record. Throughout the presentation, we will be guiding you through the basics of requesting a baptism, marriage, funeral, or burial. We will also discuss the variations in records and spellings of last names. Lastly, we will briefly touch on the process of requesting dual citizenship certificates from us. But before we get into the nitty gritty, here are some things that you will need to know. First, I know that Kimberly mentioned this in the first session. But before you send in any request, please reference the document, books held by the Office of Archives and Records, and see if we hold the records you are looking for. You can locate this document in the genealogy section of our website or on the New Orleans Public Library programming page. Second, the form, which we will discuss more in the next few slides, provides you with a layout for all the information you will need to send in a request. Lastly, just so everyone knows, the fee for genealogy request is $12. That is cash, check, or money order per individual request. The $12 covers the research that we conduct, a true and exact translation of the record if we are able to locate it, or a research report, which lists all of the churches that we searched. That is if we are unable to. Before we get started, I wanted to show you how to access the genealogy form on our website. First, you will need to search the website link, which is archives, A-R-C-H-I-V-E-S dot A-R-C-H hyphen N-O dot org. You can also reach it through the Archdiocese of New Orleans website by looking for archives and records under the ministries and offices tab. Once you get to our homepage, you will see eight boxes directing you to different information. You will want to you will want to click on the box that says genealogy and then click on the PDF link that says click here for genealogy re genealogy request form. I'm sure that many of you are very familiar with this form, but for those of you who are not, this is our genealogical records request form. To request any genealogy record from us, we prefer that you fill out this form and mail it in with the fee of $12. So that we can get a better look at the form, I have split it into two. On this first part, you can see the guidelines that we have set for genealogy requests. Requests for family or genealogical information are handled by mail only. Certificates will be issued for the specific record requested and will include pertinent family information. When a record is not found, a research report will be issued. Family tree research slash genealogical lines are not available. Only four requests may be submitted at one time. 
Additionally, there is some information that we require before we can begin researching. For us to begin, we will need an exact date or church. If that is not known, you must provide detailed information, such as the parents' names, New Orleans addresses, name of priest to perform the sacrament, date of birth or death, etc. You can find this information by checking city directories. Sorry, I'm gonna wait till she gets to the okay. By checking city can directories. I, can I stop for a second? Yeah. Um, if you are on a phone or otherwise, can you please be sure to mute your audio? Um, just as a courtesy of the speaker. Thank you. Okay. Um, you can find this information. So for the additional information we were discussing earlier by checking city directories, census records, obituaries, state issued marriage licenses, birth certificates and death certificates. You can visit the links to these resources on our website. Also, Amanda will be discussing how to access and use the civil information later in this presentation. Next, the number of Catholic churches in the archdiocese increased rapidly after 1840. For example, in 1800, there were only five churches within the boundaries of what we consider the archdiocese today. Then in 1820, there were six churches. 1840, there were nine churches. 1860, there were 31 churches. In 1880, there were 44 churches. In 1900, there were 54 churches. And by 1920, there were 69 churches in the archdiocese. The rapid increase in churches is why we say that any request after 1845 must include the name of the church or address of, it, of the participants. Churches do not always have an index for every sacrament, and unfortunately, the database is incomplete after 1845 and ends completely in the 1860s. Lastly, on our list of required information is that any request for cemetery records must include as much information as possible, such as the name, date of death within a month, and if possible, the cemetery. I will discuss this more in a later slide. As you go down the form, you see a blank for you to fill in the information on the church where the sacrament was performed. Next, you circle one of the sacraments. Please only circle one sacrament per request. If you are requesting another sacrament for the same individual, please fill out another form. Finally, on this slide, fill in the name of the individual or individuals, if it's a marriage, at the time of sacrament. On this second part of the form, you see blanks for approximate date of sacrament, date of birth, and date of death. Next is the name of the parents. And then you see a notes section. This area is for you to fill in with any additional information you have on the family or individual. We encourage you to add any and all information, such as census data, city directories, or obituaries. Really anything that will help us in the search to help you. Now let's get into the fun. Let's talk about the basics of requesting a baptismal record. As you can see on the slides, we have two baptismal records. On the top is the baptism for George Helmer, who was baptized at St. Joseph's Church in Gretna in 1899. In this baptism, you can see that the record keeper provided you with the name of the parents, sponsors, and the area where they were living. The next baptism is from St. John the Baptist Edgard. It is for August, who is the son of Catherine, enslaved by La Trinelle. The other information provided is the name of his sponsors. You cannot see it in this image, but he was baptized in part of a mass baptism that occurred on the 1st of June in 1809. Both of the records mentioned here have similar information, the name of the person who was baptized, the date, the parent or parent's name, the church where the baptism occurred. Without the requester providing us with that information, we wouldn't have been able to locate the record. When requesting a baptismal record, it is very beneficial for us and you to have as much information as you can. Some of the information you will need to know before you request is 
an approximate date or a small year range of the baptism. Unfortunately, not all of our books have indexes, so a small year range helps us when we conduct a page-by-page -page search. We ask that you keep the year range between two to three years. This is especially true when researching enslaved and free persons of color baptismal records. The more information you can give us, the more likely we are to be able to locate it. Also, you will need to know the name of the person you are searching for. Alternative spellings of surnames are always appreciated. Next, any information on the church where the sacrament took place. As I mentioned previously, the database is incomplete after 1845, so any other information is helpful. Additionally, if you are searching for an enslaved person's baptismal record, it is helpful to know the name of the enslaver. Lastly, we will need to know the names of the parents. Up next in our basics is requesting a marriage record. Just like requesting a baptismal certificate, you will need to know the date of marriage or a small date range. If the couple is married in Orleans Parish, you can check for the date of marriage by looking for a marriage license on the Louisiana Secretary of State website or for the Justice of the Peace record on the New Orleans Public Library page. Another thing that is very helpful to us is the name of the church where the marriage occurred or the priest who performed the marriage. You might be wondering, how do I locate the information on the priest who performed the marriage? Well, when researching a Catholic marriage, a state license can be very helpful. It can be a great way to grow your family tree, and it can also provide us with information we need to help you. When you order the marriage license from us, or when you order the marriage license from the state, <laughs> some of the information it can include is the date, the names of the parties, and the priest's name if it was a Catholic marriage. If you know the name of the priest that performed the marriage, then we can search our records and see if we can locate the church where he was stationed at at the time of the marriage. If you do not know the church or the priest, the address or area where the, where the parents were living can assist us in the search. Additionally, another helpful document is a baptism of their first child. There is reasonable chance that it could be at the same church. Lastly, we will need to know the name of the bride and groom. And please give us any additional spelling variations. It helps us help you. It wasn't until the early 1900s that funerals within churches became a common thing. Many funerals before the 1900s were held within family homes. This is one reason why our funeral records, why most of our funeral records do not begin until the late 1800s or early 1900s. There are very few that have records for funerals before that time period. If you would like a list of those churches that do have funeral records, please check the books held by the Office of Archives and Records document. When requesting a funeral record from us, we will need to know the name of the individual, date of birth, and church where the funeral occurred. If you do not have that particular information, then you will need to check the obituary index provided by the New Orleans Public Library for a citation, and then view the original obituary through the newspaper database with your library card. When you locate it, see if it mentions the funeral location or any other beneficial information. Last but definitely not least in our basics are requesting burial records. Same as before, we will need the name of the individual and any alternative spellings. Also, we will need to know the date of death and where they are buried. That information can be gleaned from the obituary of the individual. In general, burials were recorded, accord, were recorded according to cemetery and date, often without an index, which is why we will need an almost exact date of death, at least a month and a year, for us to complete your request. Always remember that not all burials are the exact same. They sometimes varied based off the New Orleans Health Commissioners and the record keepers at that time. For example, when you look at the image on the top of the slide, you see a burial record from St. Louis Cemetery No. 1 of a stillborn from Miss T.D. Dimitri, who died on August 8, 1887. 
It provides you with the date of death, the child's race, gender, how far along the mother was when the child was stillborn, and the tomb where the child is buried. The burial on the bottom is from St. Joseph's Cemetery for an Anne Moran, who died on March 15th, 1872. Her record only includes that she was a native of New Orleans, her age, where she died, and her cause of death. Although these are both burial records, they vary in the information that is provided within them. Some burial records have more information than you could dream of, and others make you wish there was a different record keeper that day. Burial records for cemeteries are divided between us and the New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries Office. Next, Heather Veneziano will talk about how to locate contemporary cemetery records on the burial record search and how to decide who to call for cemetery records. Hello everyone, I'm Heather Veneziano, Director of Public Engagement and Development for New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. As Katie pointed out during the previous slide, there's some basic information necessary for us to locate a burial record. Having the name of the individual, including alternate spellings and maiden name when applicable, date of death and name of the cemetery are paramount to us trying to successfully locate a record. Before contacting us, it is also a good idea to first check the burial search function on the website of New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. The web address is present on this slide, but it could also be accessed through the header bar on the homepage of New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries, nolacatholiccemeteries.org. There you will be able to do a search using the individual's name and have it apply to all of our cemeteries, or you may choose a select one. Please note that though the tool may be helpful to many, it is not a comprehensive database of all those interred within our cemeteries. The information that it contains was imported from, in from index cards housed at, at our main office. If the record was not recorded on those index cards, then it is not present within the database. However, it does offer useful information for those that are included. Next slide. So what if you cannot locate your ancestor within the database? That's when you should reach out to us or the Office of Archives and Records. This slide details information also available in the session packet as a PDF download. Burial and internment books and records are split between New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries and the Office of Archives and Records of the Archdiocese of New Orleans. Within our holdings, the records are further split between our three offices. As you can see from the list, we focus mainly on 20th and 21st century records, whereas archives records tend to overlap the 19th and 20th centuries. Please be sure to make use of this document. The sooner you contact the correct office, the closer you will be to obtaining the information that you desire. As we stated back in session one of last week, there will unfortunately be gaps in the books. Flood, fire, and sometimes inadequate recording of facts leave us today with missing information. These gaps present many challenges to us and we share in your frustration when specific entries are not available. It is also worth noting that sometimes the burial or interment was recorded but without any location information other than the name of the cemetery itself. This is especially the case with some of our older books. So often, burial location information was simply common knowledge, and so the sexton did not find it worth recording. It serves as a good reminder to us that the common knowledge of today will be the great mysteries of tomorrow, and with that, detailed documentation is always something to strive for. And now back to Katie with a little bit of lanyap. Sorry, I should probably unmute myself before I start talking. Um, before we get into my favorite part of genealogy, let me tell you about a little land yap we have for y'all. Well, you can't request a family tree during your search, if we run across additional family records, we will let you know. That way you can request them in a later search. For example, we will contact you if we locate other children or siblings of the individual you, you are looking for. If we are unable to locate the record you are looking for, but you find additional information after we have sent you a research report, please let us know. Instead of sending in a completely new request for the same person, you can call us and we will do additional research for the record based off the new information. No fee required. Additionally, if you request a record from a church and we don't hold the records that we don't hold the records for, or the book is missing, we will either mail back your check or give you a credit for future searches. Please know that if you provide us with the name of a church, 
but the record is not there, we will continue to look for the record. We will check churches that are within the same area, nationality, or race of the individual or individuals you are looking for. It is the same thing if you mention it's a free person of color. We will check both the free person of color books and the white books. Okay, so now moving on to the best part, in my opinion, of genealogy, the different languages within our records. We hold records in French, Spanish, Italian, Latin, German, and English. Due to changes in governments which control Louisiana and immigration to New Orleans, records can appear in many different languages. In this slide, you see records written in English and French. If you look at the first image on the left of the screen, it is written in English on the top of the page and French at the bottom. The second image is a baptismal record written completely in French. Almost always when we are working on genealogy within our records, the sacramental entries appear in different languages. Just to show off a few more of the different languages we hold, on this slide, you can see some of our records in Latin on your left, Spanish on your right, and German at the bottom. Previously in the presentation, I mentioned the occurrence of spelling variations within our records. I just wanted to give you all some examples in this slide, you will see variations of the last name Campbell, spelled C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L. -L. That's what the requester sent in for. And this is what we found. On this slide, you see within these records, it has been spelled Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L, -L, Campbell, C-A-M-B-B-E-L-L, -L, and Campbell, Campbell, C-A-M-B-E-L. The record on the bottom is a baptism for Caroline Campbell, C-A-M-B-E-L. And the record on the top is a funeral for the same Caroline Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L. -L. The same person, but her last name is spelled differently in two of her records. The other record on the side is a baptism for her sister, Isabella Campbell, C-A-M-B-B-E-L-L. -L. You can see that spelling within the father's name. These show just a small variation that can occur in records, even within family. Here you see a baptismal entry for Darabone. We located this record when researching for a Terrebone. After cross-checking the record for the date of birth and the parents' names, we knew that this was the record that we were looking for. The name was just spelt differently. This is why it is very important for you to provide us with as much information as you can. That way we can corroborate the information and it is more likely that we will be able to locate the record you wanted. The reason for the confusion is that in a society where the spoken word rather than the written word was a common mode of communication, it often caused multiple spellings within records. This is the case within our records. Sometimes colonial priests simply recorded the names as they sounded. The spelling of names and places was usually phonetic and the format differed from priest to priest. I will show you another example of this in the next slide. Here you will see the baptisms for the children of Alexandro Gravel, Gravier, and Marie Lachaise, Lachaise, Laluce, LaRose multiple variations of spelling. As you can see in the text provided above the images, almost all the names are spelled differently. Beginning at the top left of your screen, you see the baptism for Joseph Gravel. His baptism was celebrated in 1772 and recorded in French. His parents listed as Alexandre Gravel and his mother Marie Lelouce. Then in 1774, his sister Marie Gravel was baptized. Her parents were recorded as Alexandre Gravel and Marie La Rose. It is also written in French. At the bottom left of your screen, the baptism for Alexandro 
was celebrated in 1776 and recorded by a Spanish record keeper. His father's name is recorded as Alexandro Gravel and his mother is Marie Lacase. At the bottom right corner next to him is his sister Celeste Gravier, who is baptized in 1782 and recorded as the daughter of Alejandro Gravier and Marie Lachase. This is another example of the differences you see within family records. As I have mentioned before, the variations in spelling can come from the language spoken by the record keeper or how they phonetically spelt their names. Changes in spelling. Archdiocesan certificates are an exact and true representation of what is recorded in the register. Names, places, and dates appear as written. There are variations due to, due to the record keeper who often wrote the names as he heard it. It is the policy of this office that records of deceased persons and historic records, those over 100 years, remain as written during the time of the sacramental event. Although their names might be spelt differently than you, the requester originally thought, they are, they are the true and exact copy of the register. The name variation can lead you through interesting parts of history to understand your family and where they or their name came from. In recent years, we have had an influx of requests for certificates to aid in dual citizenship applications. The requesting of a certificate for dual citizenship application is very similar to requesting a genealog genealogy record. The only difference is that it is an additional $8 fee because it will need to be notarized by our ecclesiastical and civil notary, which is required to use the document for dual citizenship. When filling out the form, please note that you are requesting the document for dual citizenship. Additionally, it will take some extra time for us to complete the request for dual citizenship. This is because of the need for notarizations. Although we do prepare for extra time, we will always try to complete the request as quickly as we can. Thank you so much for listening. And now Amanda Fallis from the City Archives Division of the New Orleans Public Library will provide you with information and resources at the library that will help you find the information you need to request a record from us. I need to unmute myself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie and Heather. That was fabulous. Um, now we are going to continue on to my part of the presentation, which uh, should go by pretty quickly so we can get to questions for everyone. Um, I am Amanda Fallis, an archivist at the City Archives and Special Collections at New Orleans Public Library. And today I'm going to be talking about resources at our institution that can help you find some of the important data points you may need for filling out the sacramental records request form. To begin, of course, you want to know about our website. This is free and open to anyone, requires no library card, no nothing. It is archives.nolalibrary.org. That is a comprehensive list of guides or finding aids as they are known um, of all of the hundreds of thousands of records contained in the city archives. We specifically, when it comes to genealogy, want to refer you to our guide to genealogical materials and of course our obituary index, but really everything under the genealogy section of our website. As you can see here in this little pull box, I've got the genealogy section highlighted and the two most important resources also highlighted. The guide to genealogical materials is a fabulous guide that was first started in the early 2000s by our previous city archivist, Irene Wainwright, with the help of Wayne Everard. Uh, it, is, it was a comprehensive printed book that later we moved to the online or to our website into a purely digital form. Even though you see in this picture, it may say we hope to reprint the guide in 2011, we are well past then and we are all digital on this guide now. 
what it does is it splits our records into sections and each section will detail the scope of the records we have related to that section, whether it be birth records, death records, marriage records. Just a hint, we don't have any birth records, but it says that when you click on it. Um, of course, records relating to slavery, free people of color, court records, immigration, naturalization, all sorts of stuff. This guide is the comprehensive way for genealogists to make sense of the records at the city archives and how they can help them. It is a one-stop shop for everything genealogy in the city archives and special collections at New Orleans Public Library. Today, I'm gonna to focus on the specific collections that I think will be of most help to finding out the information you need to fill out certain form or certain fields on the archives of the Archdiocese request form. And those today are going to be the marriage records, our obituary index, naturalization records, succession and other court records. Of course, I'll refer to the Secretary of State website, even though that isn't us, it's critical and it is a way to access some of our records and others. Find a grave and other grave site locators city directories and census records. Both of these last two will be able to, anybody with a St. Tammany, Jefferson, Orleans, or East Baton Rouge Parish Library and possible other small parishes as well will be able to access the city directories and census records via online databases. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Let's begin with marriage records. So we hold the Orleans Parish Justice of the Peace records from 1846 to 1880. They are indexed on our website and can be accessed through the Guide to Genealogical Materials. Generally, parents' names are not given unless one of the parties was a minor, but that doesn't mean it's not worth looking. You may find a priest's name, as they mentioned previously. Um, no certificates in the secular record collection are going to be available unless they were married by a justice of the peace. But generally, even if you're married by a justice of the peace, you also had a ceremony presided over by the minister of your religion. Uh, the next section is the New Orleans Recorder of Birth, Deaths, and Marriages and the Board of Health Records, which span 1870 to 1915. These uh, include both certificates and licenses, and generally the parents' names are given. These are also somewhat available through Ancestry.com. New Orleans marriages after 1880, but older than 50 years, are at the Louisiana State Archives, which is sos.la.gov. Um, if they're more recent than 50 years, they're still going to be at the Clerk of Civil District Court, which you will need to contact directly. Let's talk about online indexing for the marriage records. Luckily, at our website, archives.nolalibrary.org, through the guide to genealogical materials or other access points on the website, we have indexing of the Justice of the Peace records from 1846 to 1880. They're organized by name of the bride and by name of the groom. It's very handy. You don't need to know this whole website address that I have listed here. Just go to archives.nolalibrary.org and either go to the directly to the court's description pages or go to the guide to genealogical materials and access it through that. The Board of Health Records, which are later, are uh, combined with some of the Justice of the Peace indexing and are available at ancestry.com through 1920. And there are also transcriptions of the same sort of amalgamation on the volunteer website, Orleans Parish Gen Web. Um, it, there is a website address here, but what you can simply do is go, us, go to usgwarchives.net and then click on Louisiana and then click on New Orleans. Of course, Orleans Parish marriage records specifically are available on the Secretary of State websites too, up to the dates I mentioned on the previous page. Next, this is our other big reference item and it is the obituary index. It is a collaborative database uh, created jointly between New Orleans Public Library and the historic New Orleans collection staff and volunteers. It replicates the original index cards done by the WPA in the 40s, and then includes the additions created by volunteers up through 1972. 
as you can see here, that means it covers various New Orleans newspapers from 1804 to 1972. There are, of course, links off to the left side here on the sample screen I've shown, the most relevant being other New Orleans OBIT indexing projects. That will get you to the US GenWeb volunteer obituary indexing that goes up through 2012. Oops, 2012, sorry. It's a little bit further in the future, 2012. Um, but so that link will get you there. And another important thing to note is this is an index. It will get you a citation to get you to the obituary which you would then access using your library card and going to the newspaper databases. Or if you are in a parish outside of the four ones that I have mentioned, St. Tammany, Jefferson, Orleans, or East Baton Rouge, you can also subscribe to newspaper sites like newspapers.com or genealogybank.com and use the citations from this free database to locate the articles through there. This is just a quick sample of what the obituary index looks like. To the left, I have the search bar. As you can see, it has the surname or last name, first name, middle name, and date of death. Word to the wise, this is a very sensitive database. I always recommend starting with the last name only. If you get too many results that way, then go back and add in the first name. Rarely would I recommend entering the middle name or the date of death because you may completely obscure like what you're actually looking for and never get the result. And of course, here is an example search result to the right. It is for Henry B. McMurray Jr. He died on February 8th, 1914. And as you can see, these are the citations. It gives the paper, the date, the page, and the column number. As you can see, he had four. That could be four unique ones, but more than likely, it's a couple of reprints and perhaps one that's slightly different at the end of the week, more of a death notice than a full obituary. But the reason obituaries are important is if you locate one and locate a citation and then take that to the newspaper databases and find the article, you may find the cemetery you need. Naturalization records. So we offer sort of declarations of intentions and certificates and some oaths, depending on the court, from Orleans Parish Civil Courts from 1828 to 1906, criminal courts from 53 to 99, and the federal US District Court for the Eastern District of Louisiana from 1813 to 1932. So depending on where your person appears, the date range will affect that. It's important to note that just because somebody was naturalized in a criminal court doesn't mean anything. Basically, you went to the courthouse nearest your location to get naturalized when you did. There is no bearing on whether it was civil or criminal. It didn't mean anything. Um, so what you can do is you can email or mail us to conduct a search of these three indices up to five names per request. And that's each name is a spelling as well. If you want us to search five spellings, that counts as five names in a request. Fees may apply depending on how we advance during the pandemic. Um, indexing, this indexing that we show here, is available through Ancestry.com and Heritage Quest for the date listed, 1831 through 1906, as part of the U.S. Naturalization Records Indexes, 1791 to 1922. When we do conduct these searches for you, if we do not locate a name, we will send you a picture of the index where the name should be and that it is clearly missing. If we do find a reference to a certificate or a declaration or a petition, we will make a copy of that document for you. Next, court records. I could talk to you about court records for the next five to six hours, but we don't have that kind of time today, unfortunately. Um, some of you that have, may have attended past sessions may know how complicated the court system in Orleans Parish is. As, as uh, Katie mentioned before, a lot of that is because New Orleans has been under so many different governments and changes of government. We went through numerous court systems just spanning the record collection which we have at the city archives which covers various courts from 1804 to 1926. 
It's very complicated, but you can read more about it on our website and through the Guide to Genealogical Materials. A little bit of history is that they were deposited by the Clerk of Civil District Court in the 1970s and 1980s with us. We retain what they gave us. Missing records were generally absent before the transfer. Now, a lot of these records, those deemed genealogically significant, those that are probate, divorce, emancipations, suits, and successions, etc., those were microfilmed by the Genealogical Society of Utah, AKA the Church of Latter-day Saints in the 80s and 90s. They spent about five years in our basement doing this. Those have also since many of them become digitized on familysearch.org. If you don't already have an account with familysearch.org, it is completely free and it's excellent. I'll talk a little bit more on that in a second. Indexing for courts. Generally, if you want a court case, you're gonna need a docket number. You will need the court name as well because docket numbers are repeated between the nine to 12 different courts that may have happened. That's why the date is also important. If you really can't figure out the court name, the date is crucial to us figuring out the court name. Here's a quick rundown though of succession courts. There's the court of probates, which ran from 1804 to 1846. Indexing is available on our website and it's also available on familysearch.org. Second district court, which ran probate from 1846 to 1880. That indexing is also available on our website and available at familysearch.org. Civil district court took over in 1880 and we have the records through 1926, but the indexing is only available through 1903. Much like the explosion of Catholic records, there was a ginormous explosion of civil records as well. Civil district court records are so voluminous, even in the 40 years that we've had them, there's been no way that we've been able to catalog them all. Of course, for beyond 1903, there are docket books available on microfilm. Please email us with our contact information at the end of the presentation if you think it's beyond that point and we'll work with you to see if the search is, is doable. Digital access. The Orleans Parish wills, successions, and estate inventories from 1804 to 1880 are digitized and available at familysearch.org. They're very high quality black and white scans. Um, oftentimes you will need to know the docket number to locate your person, but it's pretty comprehensive. There are only a few gaps. I highly recommend going to familysearch.org, going to Louisiana and looking at Louisiana probate collections. Another grouping of records, especially the very early ones, can be found at Louisiana Digital Library, the free state digital library. That's louisianadigitallibrary.org. Our court records are parts of LSU's Bicentennial Purchase Collection. Those are the very earliest court and probate records. And also we have emancipations and other records relating to free people of color in their free people of color collection. Those are also very high resolution images and they're in color as well. Of course, I need to mention the Secretary of State indexes since both I and our Archdiocese speakers have mentioned them. The Secretary of State website is sos.la.gov. It is key to finding birth, marriages, and deaths. Those are important for finding parents' names. Of course, they do hold some records prior to 1918 for Orleans Parish, but it generally starts after that for others. The state of Louisiana didn't require vital record entries until 1918, that's why. New Orleans being a large city did start keeping records before then. Only Orleans Parish marriage records are held here. That was a legal decision made a long time ago that for some reason Orleans Parish marriage records would be turned over to the state instead of held in the parish where they occurred, which is the case for all the other parishes in the state. Full documents, both certified and uncertified, are available by mail order through the Secretary of State. What it is, is once you find your person in one of the indices, you will see a little link off to the side that says print form. You'll need to click on that, print it out, fill it out, and follow the mailing and fee instructions. 
As you can see here, I have a picture of the main page at sos.la.gov. I've got a red square around the place that you're going to be going, which is going to be historical resources and then underlined research historical records. That's going to be where you're going to find the vital records index behind a link towards the bottom. Burial locators. There is no comprehensive index to all the cemeteries in New Orleans, unfortunately. There have just been too many denominations, too many cemeteries, too many governments, et cetera, et cetera, for any sort of comprehensive indexing to happen. A list of cemetery records available in the Louisiana Division can be found in the Guide to Genealogical Materials I showed you. Of course, there are going to be some access restrictions due to COVID. Please email us if you have questions. But in the meantime, what I highly recommend is the best websites for finding graves are Find a Grave, the classic, findagrave.com, saveourcemeteries.org, a nonprofit helping New Orleans cemeteries, the Billion Graves section of familysearch.org. Just go to familysearch.org and search Billion Graves, no space. And then of course, I also recommend for New Orleans and more in general, la-cemeteries.com. All of these will be key to you finding your, uh, possibly a connect, like the overlay of all these will hopefully let you find some information on a person's burial. And then of course, the obituaries, as we mentioned earlier. If you have obituary information that gives you the burial location, that will obviously help too. And then of course, city directories and census records. These are going to be your bread and butter of finding additional information about people. While I am mentioning them close to last, I do recommend you go to these first. Censuses, complete federal censuses, are now available at Ancestry.com and HeritageQuest. Ancestry.com is continually expanding its free home access to library card holders. I know that it's available to you for free from home at least through the end of the month. Heritage Quest is Ancestry Light, and I believe all four of the parishes I mentioned have access to Heritage Quest from home year round. I know we do, for sure. Um, information, but not the actual images of the census, are available, of course, at familysearch.org as well. And these are key to finding parents' names and, of course, also siblings, but primarily parents' names, particularly for women under their maiden name. Of course, then there are city directories. These are generally requests for, via email from the city archives, limit five, fees may apply, but um, many of them after a certain point are available on ancestry.com and Heritage Quest. Now, uh, the main thing that you might need to write the city archives for city directory wise are the early ones. 1806 through 1861 are on microfiche and they are not on Ancestry or Heritage Quest. Those are the ones you'll probably need to email us about. Um, it's important to know that when you re make requests of us, uh, we count each unique name and year as one entry. If you're looking for Kyle Smith in 1973, that's one request. If you're looking for him in 1974, that's a second request. If you're looking for Ashley Olson in 1973, that's a third request. 1974, a fourth request. That's how we measure requests for uh, city directories. Now, it's important to know that while we do have 1866 to 1959 on microfilm, those are available on Ancestry.com and Heritage Quest. 1960 to present are available in books in our, decision, in our division. Those likewise you would need to email or mail us to request because I know on Ancestry.com the city directories only go up through 1963 for Orleans. And that's the same for Heritage Quest. And here's just a quick overview of genealogy databases from New Orleans Public Library for New Orleans Public Library cardholders. Although I do know that um, Jefferson Parish and East Baton Rouge Parish have these as well, and I believe St. Tammany too. Um, there's of course Ancestry.com Library Edition. In normal non-pandemic times, those are generally available in library access only. They do have the most robust genealogy collections, but as I said before, currently they are offering it for free to uh, library or to library card holders at least through the end of the month, and I imagine they will continue to extend that on a month-by-month -month basis. Um, 
Heritage Quest is available to Hobbit patrons all the time, and it's Ancestry Light, as I said. It's got all the key collections, such as census, directories, passenger list, vital record indexes, naturalization indexes, etc. And then last, this is newer to us, but I know other locations have, or other um, parishes have had it a little bit longer. There's Fold 3. It has military records and or testimonials for all American wars. Of course, the actual records are going to pertain to earlier wars because there will, because the people who participate in those wars will already have died and the records will become more public. Newer ones, obviously not, as some of those people may still be alive. Okay, that concludes my part of the presentation. Let's gear up for the question and answer session for the next 15 minutes. Let me give you a couple of question and chat guidelines. Only submit your questions via chat once I turn it on momentarily. Please keep it clear of conversations or crosstalk. Do not repeat your question multiple times. Submit only one question per participant, unless of course there's deafening silence, in which case you can, of course, submit a second one. I wouldn't worry though, if you do have a second one, we will be putting up our contact information in a moment and you can always email or call us. Make sure that your questions pertain to the information presented today. If you have one for future sessions, reserve it for then. If you have one for a past session, you can either email us or you can check out the recording from last week. We will get to as many questions as we can by 12.15, we may go a little over. And as I've said multiple times, feel free to contact any of us if we don't get to your question today. And if you aren't able to attend future sessions where your question might be more applicable, again, contact us. So I am now about to open chat and I will mediate questions for all of us. Let's see here. Okay. Chat should now be active. You guys are now welcome to start entering your questions into chat. And I am going to leave this up for a second while you guys begin asking questions and then I will move to our contact information and leave that up for the rest of the presentation. So Heather, Katie, you ready? Yeah. Oh. Okay, here's our first question. My grandparents were married by the Justice of the Peace in St. Bernard Parish in 1937, but a year or so later got quote unquote married in St. Louis Cathedral. How common was this? And would the church have required a copy of their civil certificate for their files? Okay. Um, so that is common to happen. Um, it would just be that they bless the marriage within the church. Uh, they would have required it for the marriage to occur, but it wouldn't have been a file that would have been capped after. Yeah, she says that St. Bernard says their marriage record no longer exists and can only provide the date. That may be due to the loss of St. Bernard records, and I'm not sure if she meant the parish or the church, but I'm yeah. assuming it was probably the parish. And you can always request that marriage certificate from the church, too, and you can have that same information, well, some, some of the same information. Okay, the next one, Knoll Library says it has marriage, death, burial, and church records. What's the difference from sacramental records obtained through the archdiocese? So New Orleans Public Library is the city archives, the administrative secular archives of the city of New Orleans. That means we have civil records as opposed to sacramental records. Mm -hmm. Our marriage, death, and burial are going to be those created on the government side as opposed to the church side. Now, while we do say we have some church records, those are um, random and generally Protestant records. They're just some books that we did come into possession of that were microfilmed, or there are additional um, church records that we ordered from the Church of Latter-day Saints on microfilm just to have available to researchers. The next one, how can I find a pre-1846 marriage record? Generally for New Orleans, you will probably need to hope that they are Catholic and turn to the church. But pre-1846, you're going to have to look generally at the church that your ancestor may have been married in. Let's see here. Next question. Can we get actual document copies from the archdiocese as well as transcriptions? 
Yes, you can. Um, that is just an additional $8 and we will send you the, um, the transcription that we do and the image. You can't order the image though without the transcription. So they come together, um, but you can just order the transcription. So it's just an additional $8 to order that image. Okay, the next question is for me. What are the most often used on-site records at the library? Those not available online. Those are going to be the administrative records of the city of New Orleans. Those will be records from mayoral administrations, from other public administrations, um, and, and the court records if somebody is doing in-depth academic research on specific information on court records that aren't otherwise digitized. Right now, uh, we are focusing on stuff that is too voluminous to be digitized and just can't really be ac accessed any other way. Generally, if it's on microfilm and it's easy to find, we're trying to offer that digitally to people. Okay, NOLA passenger list from the 1880s and 1890s. Those are available on Ancestry.com or Heritage Quest. We will not be offering those on site or via email. We will direct you to Ancestry.com or Heritage Quest. Again, those two databases can be accessed with your New Orleans Public, Jefferson, or St. Tammany Public Library card at this juncture. Oh, in East Baton Rouge Parish. If you're looking for New Orleans passenger lists from the 1880s and 1890s, those are based off federal records. So they are federal film. That's why they are on Ancestry.com. Let's see here. Next question. Does the Archdiocese have a listing by date of when churches were open? Um, so if you look, as I mentioned within the presentation, there is the books held by the Archdiocese um, Office of Archives and Records. On there, it'll list um, what when the records start for each book. If you would like a list of when churches opened, you can always send us an email and I'd be happy to, because we do have a list of that, it's just not available on our website. So I would be happy to provide that if you just send us an email. Okay. Uh, next, if I have a record in Spanish, French, how can I have it translated? I think that's an it depends for all of us. Yeah, we don't translate anything that's outside of our holdings. Um, but we always say that any genealogy society is probably where you should go just to, because they have better access to people who can help you. Right, right. Um, we as the public library can't offer any specific preference because these are usually paid services. But I do know the clerk of civil district court has had a page for some time. I'm not sure how current it is of people that you might be able to contact for translation. But oftentimes what I do end up recommending to people is to Google professional translation New Orleans. Mm -hmm. oh. Next, I have a naturalization certificate for an ancestor in 1849. How can I find the petition filed for this? If it's available, there should be a number on your certificate that links back to the petition. You can, uh, I would say what you should do is email the city archives. Oh, I forgot to change your contact information. Let me put that up here. I would say email the city archives and ask us to perform an index search or, perverse, or perform the index search yourself on Ancestry.com. Generally, if there's an additional entry, it will be listed on there. But email us and we'll see what we can do uh, given the naturalization certificate. Of course, an image of the naturalization certificate in the email will be most helpful. I am trying to get info on family, birth, death, marriage in New Jersey. What is the I'm best? I'm a New Jersey native, and I could answer that because I have to do that all the time for my family. Um, <laughs> so the first place you want to start is Ancestry. That's where I start. Um, online, some records are available through a, a, another website that took all the vital records for most years and digitized them. If you email NOLA Catholic Cemeteries and ask for me, I could send you that link. Um, but I would start off with Ancestry. You could also write into the state for vital records for genealogical searches in New Jersey. It has to all be done through mail and you pay a fee by check. Um, and then you have the option of doing certified or uncertified and you, you don't need certified. So it's a less uh, expensive fee. But if you send me an email, I'll help you navigate New Jersey because you're lucky <laughs> that that's where I'm from. Yeah, I was going to say, um, your, your initial instinct to speak to New Jersey Public Libraries was spot on. 
but mm -hmm. yes, luckily we have Heather here today. Next question. Is there a form, a specific form to use for the cemeteries for burial records if you want something directly from the cemetery's office? We do not have um, a specific, specific form to fill out. If you want something directly from us, I would suggest checking on that paper that I included in the part of my presentation that tells you where, who might have the record. So it might be that archives and records holds that instead of the Catholic cemeteries. Um, so take a look at that, but we do not have a specific form. So I would again recommend emailing us or calling us at the main office and that information is on the screen right now. Okay, the next question. Is the early city directory info on microfiche available for public to view at the library? Not given phase two guidelines, and I can't obviously speak to phase three guidelines. Right now, you would need to email us for that search, and you can email the email address on screen for early city directory searches. Um, the next question. When remains are transferred from one cemetery to another, are the names of the people recorded in records of the new cemetery? Um, do you want to do this one, Heather? You can do it. I could add. Okay. So sometimes, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so it just depends on uh, the record keeper at the time when the person was transferred, they could notate it on the original burial in the first cemetery, or they could notate it on the date and that they were transferred. It really just depends if you have a date of their transfer, that is also very helpful. Mm -hmm when we're looking for it. As, as for city cemeteries, um, right now, there's not a whole lot of access to city cemetery records like that. I would probably err on the side of it's, they're not a lot. I would say if your person was buried in one of the civil secular city cemeteries, Send me an email and I'll see if we do have any resources that may indicate that. But generally my experience is not necessarily. The next question. One of my ancestors is an orphan. I found a succession record in Concordia Parish. Is there any other place to look for information? Uh, I personally would say it depends on where your ancestor was an orphan. That's, that's probably really the unfortunate to me. Uh, send me an email and I can explain more in depth what the issue is with orphanages in New Orleans. But basically what it is, is every single orphanage was run by a different order, a different secular organization. None of them had standard record keeping practices. None of them had standard preservation practices. A lot of records were lost in disasters, particularly Katrina. It's just very patchwork and all over the place. It really depends. Um, next, is there a database that I can look for records on an ancestor who is a member of a religious order? I, I'm assuming that means a Catholic religious order? I assume so. Um, there's no database like that. If you know that they were part of a religious order, we suggest that you contact the religious order and they would have their those records. Yeah, um, I, I would say, uh, as she said, it just mm -hmm. depends on the religious order and if they've maintained an archives and if they've maintained it publicly. My experience is based on the name of the or order, I often end up having to Google to find out if these orders are still around, if they yeah. maintain a website, if it's local, or if it's or if they send it to a central office like mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania somewhere, it just depends. I would say um, send send me an email, and I'll see what I can discover next. And if it's okay with y'all, can we take questions till about twelve twenty? Is that fine with you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, next. Uh, can I request sacramental records for other parishes in Louisiana, such as St. James, Assumption, et cetera? Um, so the parishes, some parishes outside the archdiocese, you would have to request records from um, like Diocese of Baton Rouge, Diocese of Lafayette, but you can always send us an email and just let us know the parishes that they were either living in and we can direct you to where, who to contact for that because off the top of my head, I can't tell you where every parish is and what diocese they fall under. But um, yeah, just send us an email and we'll be happy to help you. Excellent. Um, how do I access previous recordings? 
So uh, the quick way is go to youtube.com and search for identifying your Catholic ancestors. That seems to be the most expedient way. The other way is, of course, to bookmark our resources pages for this whole series, which is on archives.nolalibrary.org. And as I showed in the very beginning of the past, the presentation, there's a new stuff at the archive section. It's that first link right there, and it'll have a link to the recordings as they become available. Next. Where should I look for death and or burial record for someone who died early 1900s from yellow fever? It depends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's, 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 that's another complicated thing, much like orphans. A lot of people slipped through during the epidemics, unfortunately, that's a mm -hmm. fact. I would recommend trying to find an obituary, although that is sometimes a long shot given the volume of deaths. Uh, there is, of course, find a grave, et cetera. It just really depends on what happened to the person and your experience with, with uh, epidemic deaths, Heather and Katie. Yeah, it just depends on the person in the cemetery to where they, if like there's a record on them. But Knowing the, the exact date of death um, is also going to be key to helping you locate it because there's just so many options of where they might have ended up. Yeah. Unfortunately, disasters breed um, disorganization just mm -hmm. by their very nature. Unfortunately, record keeping gets spotty. I mean, the record keepers themselves were often dying. So uh, it's just the volume of disorder that, that, the, that those um, disasters and epidemics uh, engendered just can make record keeping, especially at that time, a little difficult. But um, yes, knowing perhaps the time of death, but generally you need to start the general search. You wanna search for a death certificate in the city, in the Secretary of State website. You wanna search for an obituary through our obituary index, et cetera. And just as an example of the kind of volume we're talking about here, and I'm sure Katie knows this as well, but in the month of August alone of 1853, 1,100 people were interred within St. Patrick Cemetery number one. So that's why just during times of yellow fever and other epidemics, just the volume of that the record keepers and the sextons and other individuals were dealing with, it's very difficult to locate individuals. Yeah, that's, that's you know, that's goodness, like what, 50, 60 burials a day? I mean, that, that's, that's volume that we could hardly handle today. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Next. Uh, my great-grandfather's grave is in the Balance Street Cemetery. Which site is best to find the actual grave? I have a photo of the grave, not the actual location. Balance Street is one of ours, isn't it? That's a city-owned cemetery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Send me an email, please, um, about the Balance Street Cemetery, and I will try to figure it out for you. I would say offhand, find a grave is your best start, but many of those cemeteries, it just depends on if there's a map with names, which oftentimes there is not. Uh, send me an email, and we'll take a look into it for you. Um, that's archivist at nolalibrary.org. Let's see here. I can't find a civil record, marriage record in Orleans Parish. Can I still send in a marriage request for church records when I only know the marriage was around 1875? Yes, you can still send in for the request. Um, we just ask that you provide additionally as much information. So the census records around that time, so 1880, 1870 census records where the family was living, um, the parents' names, any other additional information, like if they had a baptism that you know about or anything else will help us within the search. But you, you can still send it in without the marriage license. It just helps us a lot if, it, if you do have it. Okay, the next question. What about Baptist church or Methodist when searching for slave documents and files? In my personal experience, there is not a lot of easy access or, or even continued archiving of Baptist or Methodist churches. They seem to be very spotty and a lot of them do not have a central archives. I have not had a lot of luck with that. You, you will of course want to first find the specific Baptist or Methodist church and see if you can contact them directly if they still exist. I know this is tough, but unfortunately that's been my experience. Uh, I know there are certain um, 
places that I had hoped were more centralized, like the AME for Methodists that I've emailed and gotten no response from, like the more national chapter or regional chapter. It just, it really depends. You'll have to know the name of the church and then we'll need to kind of do a Google search for the church and then try to see if they, they maintain any record keeping at a local level and if not at a more national or organizational level. It can be very difficult, unfortunately. Um, and I also, uh, in terms of enslaved documents and files, I'm not sure how the Baptist and Methodist churches behaved in relation to slavery if they were the, uh, the white, the segregated versions of the churches. Uh, next, I have the name of a tomb in its location where an ancestor is buried. Can I get the names of others buried in the same tomb? Um, I could take this one. So unfortunately, that is extremely difficult slash impossible, maybe. Um, the way that the burial books are organized, it's by cemetery and then by date, and then it lists the name. So it's not by tomb. And a lot of times within those records, as we stated earlier, there's not even a burial location for the individual. It's just, we know that they're in this cemetery specifically. The best way, if you're, you do have a copy of the title, a lot of times family members will mark on the title everyone that's buried and in, interred within the tomb. So your family might have that um, record in their possession already. But unfortunately, no. You can, though, once you start building out your family tree using some of the tools that we've, we've shown you, if you get um, dates of death and names, we can search and see if that individual is, is interred within the tomb. So it's kind of working backwards. Um, and that's really the only way to do it. I wish that um, it was organized that we can know everyone within a tomb. It would make things a lot easier for all of us. But unfortunately, that's just not the case. Next, I have my grandmother's original baptism certificate that is 100 years old from Corpus Christi. Is there anything else that you could provide other than what is on the certificate? I, you would need to speak to that diocese, I believe. Um, well, Corpus Christi is a church in the uh, city. Sorry, I started thinking. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> Y'all go ahead. Um, I, I don't, most likely not, but you are more than welcome to contact us and send us a picture of it and we can let you know if there is more, would be more on there. And then if there is, and you can always request it from us depending on the years, because I know we only have a very limited amount of Corpus Christi records. Okay, so we've gone over. Um, I'm gonna ask the next four questions. If we didn't get to y'all's question, I apologize please use the contact information on the screen to ask us about it. I know that a lot of you I did not get to because I see that I have 41 messages beyond these. Um, but I do want to say before I ask these four questions, thank you guys for attending. I'll mm -hmm. continue more in a moment, but let's continue. How can I request a photocopy of birth, merit, and death records from the Archdiocese? Um, well, it's just the same as sending in the form. So you'll send in the form with all the information. And then on the form, you will address that you would like a photocopy of the entry. You will get a photocopy and the um, trans transcription with it. Um, if you have additional questions, you can, because it kind of can go into it, but you can always email us and I can give you the full rundown of how to do that. The next question, if I find an ancestor in their records on fold three, are those records comprehensive or will the archives in Washington DC hold more information? Um, that is, it just depends. Um, you will want to try to contact the archives in Washington DC no matter what, if you want to find out more. It just depends. It depends on the time period. It depends on what records were actually obtained by fold three. It's as, as many things in genealogy are, it's an it depends. But yes, I always recommend contacting the National Archives in Washington, DC, which is archives.gov. Let's see here, next. My parents now deceased were married in 1949 by the church. Annulment was needed before the church marriage. Where would I find the annulment record? Um, unfortunately, annulment records are not open to the public. They are closed records, but if you do request their marriage from the church, there could be a mention of it on there, but that's the only possibility of seeing any information on the annulment. 
Okay. Um, this is the last one I'm going to get to today. I'm sorry. Uh, my second great grandmother was buried in St. Louis number two in 1935. Is there an index where the graves are located? She was African American. If, um, if you contact us, we'll be able to tell you that burial location, 1935, we have pretty mm -hmm. good records for. And also in session four, which is upcoming, we're going to announce a very exciting new database that's going to be available to the public. So if you tune back in, um, that will pertain to St. Louis one and St. Louis two. Oh, that's excellent. Yes, I'm very excited about that. Mm -hmm. And if you can make it to that presentation, don't worry, we will be rec recording it as, as well. And hi, Leonard. Um, Okay, so uh, I'm sorry, but unfortunately we do have to end there. Uh, if I did not get to your question, if we did not get to your question today, once again, please use this information on the screen to contact us. Um, our next session will be an in-depth dive into the newspaper debate databases and obituaries for finding Catholic ancestors. That's going to be next Saturday, same bat time, same bat channel. Um, you should be able to use the link that you used today, and I will also try to send out links again next Friday, just in case. Um, please uh, share uh, with all your friends. We are so glad that you all made it today. Uh, we appreciate all your questions, and we're really grateful that you all have joined us for these sessions thus far. And lastly, I want to thank Heather and Katie for um, their wonderful presentations and all the information. Um, this was great, and we love working with y'all. And again, just before we all go, I want to say thank you, our loyal patrons and visitors. Um, we couldn't do it without you. And well, have a good day, y'all. And I'll leave this up for another minute before we stop. Bye.